right, what up everybody? Scuff D here. And do a little something, a little, little deck list choices that we're going through here. It is uh, June 29th, 2020. Um, recently we had a update on the patch. I'm not going to do word bearers just yet. I'm still playing around with a few of the warlords. Uh, but we recently had some uh, patches that took place mainly about the uh, the Word Bears Warlords. But there was a couple other Warlords that saw some changes, some updates, uh, some tweaks, if you will. Uh, Shapura, Cashin, uh, I believe there were some changes to the Raven Guard, and I believe Ingafell also received a little minor tweak. But I want to talk about Cashin today because it's been uh, a project I've been working on. Um, I, I, I've st said it before, I really like Dreadnoughts in general um they were that was actually that was my first model that i ever put together for 40k was a dreadnought and just the building it and figuring out what it was and kind of understanding the lore kind of was really cool i really want a dreadnought warlord to be good it's hard there's not too many of them and overall they're not that great but cash and vaughn recently received this uh the twice dead effect otherwise his ability remains exactly the same now that play right there that's overall play rate, uh, which was very low when I first started uh, before the changes. I had only played a couple of games with him for like challenges and just trying things out. After the changes, I got him up to about a 50% win rate, and then I made a lot more changes to the deck, and it's actually been on a pretty good climb since then uh, and against some key matchups too. Uh, it's Yes, it's all practice. It's all friendly. But they're all games that played out, and they're all against warlords and opponents, not bots. Um, there might be a there might be a bot in there. In practice, you get a lot less bots, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, you can farm bots all you want for rank and ladder, and that's good. You're going to have those; those are predictable. But if you really want to play against a variety of opponents, practice isn't bad. And don't let people don't let people talk you out of it, because fun is fun. Okay, um, but uh, yeah, so. He has got the twice dead effect, which, as I said, is not, uh, it's not huge, but it can make a little bit of a difference. So let's take a look at it here. The twice dead effect, what this does is basically this triggers kind of like a little mini whispers. It's this little purple card um, after his survivor has been triggered. So it goes from cost 20. You'll never be able to play it until he triggers his survivor. And then it costs one. And then you can play it. And what that does is it reduces all costs in your, of troops in your hand by two. Only the troops in your hand, not the troops in your deck. And it heals you five. Now that heal five, I, you kind of overlook initially because you're looking at that cost reduction. But that heal five can come in very big because basically your survivor triggers. You go to health five. You heal five. Now you're at health ten. But you've got to make the most of that to really capitalize on it. And I really had to scratch my head about this because I was playing the deck a few different ways, taking a look at the Salamander's Pool, and there were cards in here. I mean, let's be honest, their their Legion is, uh, it's not fantastic. It's it's suffered. They, they've made some improvements. They've made some improvements uh, to Vulcan. They've made some improvements to uh, a couple of the cards here. Not many. Just some key ones like the legendary. I think uh, Forge Father to Kill actually kind of works a lot better. Um, also, Ancient Dackler is pretty good, and that's kind of it. You know, I mean, they've been roughly the same since the get go. I think they actually the change that they made to Resilience, not at Resilience, was it Benevolent? Yeah, Resilience uh, actually made this card worse. Um, but that's whatever. That's not included in the deck. So. What I thought was, okay, how do I take advantage of Cashin's ability? Which is, it's okay. You pay two, you deal one to all enemies. That actually can work pretty well if they've got one health or you want to combine it with something like defensive satellites. But it works really well with Ash and Bones because essentially, as long as it's a targetable troop, you can pay five energy and you destroy it. It doesn't matter. And all you have to do is one damage to it. You don't even have to do that with his ability. I mean, you can just ping him with something else, but it makes it very easy to achieve Ash and Bones. Um, 
So how do I make that work? How do you take advantage of that? Well, then I started thinking too, okay, well, what does their pool got? They got a lot of Astartes, a lot of Astartes. They've got a couple vehicles, right? They've got Gardos and then they've got some Dreads. And I thought, well, first off, you know, Cashin's a Dread. It would be good if I could get a Dreadnought out and then I could get some powerful Dreadnoughts out and then they're sticky of Dreadnoughts and that would be really powerful. So I, I aimed with that initially. Also, what I tried to keep in mind is you've got the survivor cards. You've got your survivor troops. There's, there's some ones that are in there. Um, Chaplin doesn't have a survivor, but he's, he's super key. You've got your front line, and then you've got your sacrifice. Now, those guys are, are susceptible to Ambassador Melgator, and they cost, I mean, for their effect, it's arguable cost versus reward. So I wanted to do a couple different things with the deck list. I wanted to keep the deck list low in cost relatively, high in vehicles, and then also cards that generate cards. And I made some changes here. I'll, I'll, I'll go over. This is, this is the current list that I'm working with right now that is working a lot better than it was initially. Um, and as you can see, it's got a lot of your, you know, your expected salamanders cards you know you've got your you've got your chaplain you've got your ashen bones two in here because it just works so well with cash and you've got your epistolary you've got a talk uh and then i threw in dalor squad now dalor squad normally don't normally play but for that survivor two and the fact that they're a five attack i, I they've actually worked okay and then i threw in some front line here as well in addition to the uh not the, not the, where are they at? The, the Atox. I've got Sitari in there. And I think that's it for, for Frontline. But it also serves as anti-stealth. So does the, the Secretary Peltast. Now, the Secretary Peltast, you don't normally take. You know, someone might take, ah, oh, take uh, Joker Company. And Joker Company costs five. It's a little pinch. And I'd rather stun and deal two. And knowing that I can deal one with the Warlord ability makes it a little bit easier. To, to negate some of those three health, uh, uh, three health stealth units. And if they're higher than three health, I've got other cards in there that I've evolved as the deck has evolved. Now, there are some changes that I've made here. Now, initially, this deck, I had, uh, I had these, the Antitar, I had these guys in there because, you know, destroying enemy troops seems good. But I very rarely found use for them either to play or to gain the benefit and I would rather have a more important card in play so I took them out uh, I also was on the fence with Nocturne Born I took that out I did it did not make it in there I had Dragon Scale Shield in there and I actually initially the concept was Dragon Scale Shield on a uh, on some of these high value like the Dolores Squad boom drop a Dragon Scale Shield suddenly he's got shield he's got five health and he's got Survivor 2. Oh, that seems wicked. But it was very costly. If this cost 3, I'd be better with it. Or if it gave Survivor. But as it is, it's okay. I'm just going to pass on it for this deck. Um, I initially included these guys here. But their cost of their ability and the fact that they're Melgator, I just I X them out. And then I included Captain Eusebius in there. Again, too costly. And then I included two of the Xavers, and I wanted to go with supply lines for ancient Xaviers and Dackler and get them in cheap. But what I found was that as powerful as these guys could be, a 6, 7, 3 survivor, maybe even a 9, 7, they lack zero impact when they come into play. Uh, if anything, they just, just simply draw fire for a turn, and by that point, you might not be beneficial. So... You, you might not benefit from them being on board. So I actually switched them out for Doombringer. Uh, same cost, but these guys, while they have lower health, they actually do much more on the turn you play them in. They might only make it that one turn, but they are very helpful and instrumental in assisting to clear the board. But what's really the idea with this deck is that I would play a Supply Lines, get a couple Doombringers or my Ancient Dackler, Doombringers for later game, so now there are six cost. Should my whispers or my uh, my twice dead trigger, then they become a four cost. That's the idea. In addition to that, having all sorts of sticky, healthy 
troops doing sacrifice and uh, other things. Now, to go with that, I still needed cards in hand. And I was going with Mount Pharos initially because it's a troop and I could give it survivor and blah, 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 blah. I have found with this concept and overall in general, Forge Complex is superior to Mount Pharos. Uh, and I might do a video on a few of these cards that generate cards just separately and ranking them up statistically. They're both legendaries. But the cards that Forge Complex can generate for cashing over time and value have have made a big difference on the games that I've played it. Fire Drakes is just a good choice. And then I found that Planetary Purge, while initially I was on the fence about it because it seemed like it was too costly, it covers a lot of ground that this deck can sometimes have trouble with. And what's as an added benefit, depending on how you play it and when you play it, you've got to be careful depending on how many troops you've got on the board, but your troops have Survivor. So you could actually have a Planetary Purge go off kill the one maybe even the two troops that your opponent has got it hits your survivor troop it'll stop it will not continue at that point but then your your unit still remains on the board so something to keep in mind there um and then you've got storm eagles for the stunning which is crucial and one orbital combat i think initially i had two in there i've tailored it down to just one and you just got to be smarter about it there are weaknesses to this deck we're going to take a look at some gameplay here, and I'll kind of discuss some of the weaknesses, but I pinned some games. Let's take This one is just a straight-up, pretty fast and furious uh, Titan versus uh, Dreadnought battle here. So some cards are not going to be as, as useful in this matchup, and some will. But basically, I want to chew up his tactics as quickly as I possibly can. So I go drop that Roshan. The Roshan's probably not going to make it if he's got like a Ricochet or something doesn't so i'm going to drop it down i'm going to drop uh get a reduced cost vehicle i was thinking about holding off on peltest but sometimes you never know uh mandrago decks mandrago racks decks sometimes do play a couple of the stealth mechanicum troops um so i'm just going to hold on to him until i absolutely need him and then uh we're going to just draw the fire we're going to bring it down i'm going to put down that tasty dalor squad draw some fire off of that and try to whittle down some of his tactics, ideally. That's the idea. And he's got... Uh, now, here's the turn, I think, with this one. It got a little dicey here. And I think I should have probably Melgatord that uh, uh, Mortar Carrier. Because he got that off of his supply lines. I didn't. You know, c'est la vie. That's the way it goes. Um, I'll just have to eat, eat the damage. You know, was it a good play? Was it a, was it the best play? I couldn't have played him with anything else, so I feel like it probably was still a good play. Um, but so we we whittled down now his tactics, now his cards in hand. He's down to, to the three cards in hand, and while my health is looking low, that's actually kind of where this deck wants to be. Again, this deck wants to have that that option to kick off, have several troops in hand that you can drop more than your opponent would expect. And I don't know if he realized that or if he was going for a hopeful, uh, but it actually ended up working pretty good. And it's just a little bit of luck, draw, cost and raising the cost of his tactics by three there, putting bodies on the board, and he's got some pingage. He's got some pingage. Does he have enough to do it is the question. I can get a front line out, and I can stay alive, and I can live to fight another day. And all these guys are costing... Well, this guitar doesn't cost two more. Uh, he doesn't cost two less, but, you know. And at that point, just kind of wraps it up. Now, I've got uh, on the fence, I think one of the troops, one of the cards that I've got on the fence on is Manifest Destiny. I think I did end up including Manifest Destiny. Uh, just to double down on the effect of the survivor. If you can get that out and you and you go to survivor, you go to health 10 and then you heal and then you're at health 15. Or even if you play that after you've played uh, your uh, your effect, it's it's it works out actually pretty good. Um, it's, it's just a good card to have with this kind of deck that's going the distance. Now, that was kind of an aggressive deck back and forth. Not as aggressive as uh, ROM, for instance. Let's take a look at the ROM deck here. This actually was another good game. Now, with these types of games, 
you know you're going to go long. You want your vehicles in your pot in your deck for the supply lines. You want to have a supply lines in hand and not a vehicle because you've only got, I think you've only got like three vehicles in there. I only need to have three vehicles in there, and I want to be able to uh, draw uh, my vehicles with that, not versus normal normal car drawing. And then what I did here, um, I'm again using the same tactics. I'm going to bait him out. I'm just baiting out his cards. He's obviously holding back off of his, uh, off of dropping any other troops this turn, which is good because that's really the the key is being able to have bodies on board that he cannot respond to, or that are going to require him to change up his plans. And this turn lets me kind of swing it in my favor, where I'm able to pull the supply lines, get a good Doombringer for six. And you could ar you can make the argument for a Helios Mortar Carrier instead of a Doom Ringer. You don't have to have a Doom Ringer. Um, but in comboing with uh, Cashin's ability and just the way that the game states tend to go um, for, for Salamanders, and especially with a low initiative deck, I find that Doom Ringer actually uh, carries its weight very well. It carries its weight very well. So what he's doing here, another, another added bonus here for the most part with these troops is they have survivors. So for Rom, it makes it harder for him to get his battle honor. He's still got it off a couple times, but he is not uh, hes not gaining a lot of health when he's had to attack those survivor troops, which actually whittles it down a little bit more. And that could be a learning curve for him if they are if that's something that they're not, if the Rom player is not, I um, oh, can't say aware of, but like familiar enough with to think about early on, and it can make a big difference. Um, but at the same time, he might not have any options, right? Now, what I've done here uh, with the vehicles is I'm playing vehicles more than I'm playing troops. I'm playing low-cost troops because he does have the... He's word bearers, so he could have Architect of Heresy, and I don't want to put down a big nasty troop that he could just steal. I'm just going to let him throw himself on my walls of, of bodies, and I'm going to do what I do, and I'm not going to feel bad about it at all. You know, he can, he can, he can take some, some chuffs to my little boys... If he wants to take my big boys, I've got some answers for it. And he doesn't. He's got a lot, but I've still got that tent health going on. Um, we're just going to build up some bodies. And again, I'm not dropping down the fire drakes. And I think he kind of can sense that the end is coming here. So good game. We end it with a purge because that's how we get rid of all demons. That's how you get rid of all that scum. Um, but that's the idea. I'm going to play one more game here to kind of show, I think, a very... Because I think the first game, you, you might have seen the, the Whispers trigger, but I think another game here where this actually came to play uh, was with a... Kabanda? Kabanda, where are you at? Cash and Vaughn? Cash and... There we go. Kabanda! Here we go. Let's play this Kabanda game. This was actually a really good game. Um... And I think the ending turn or two will really highlight uh, the impact that the twice dead can actually have in game. It's not going to happen every game. Just like a whispers doesn't happen every game. But if you have it in mind and you're aware and you're cognizant as far as how those things can operate, you stand a better chance. Now, unfortunately, I got stuck with the Doom Ringer in hand. Not much I can do about that except, you know, go from there. Um, also... Just a little note, I was I was putting my daughter to bed while I was playing this game, and I totally did not even realize that I had Peltas in hand. Otherwise, I probably would have played the Peltas and got rid of those uh, those Slaneshis, those demonettes. Um, I was putting her to bed, and I looked down, and I was like, oh, oh, I have, oh, okay, well, all right, well, let's see what happens. So, um, I mean, it... I, it's, it's sloppy. It looks sloppy, but you know what? When you live life... When you live life on the edge and you're putting children away to bed, you just have to deal with it sometimes. That's the that's the harsh reality. Um, so yeah, not looking pretty here as far as life goes, and that's really where it, it's it's uh, it's nasty. It's nasty. Kabanda demons can be nasty. You just got to out resilience them. Um, that's sometimes easier said than done understandably so but now we've got two doom ringers out in hand we've got uh we've got 
oof, we've got a nasty front line looking, and we're wishing that we had another, uh, another, um, no, we're just going to do that just to try to eliminate any, any sort of mutations or anything that he's going to have. They're going to cost him some. And I did not expect him to go for the seven. I'll be honest. I'm not sure why he did. Uh, I guess he didn't have the eternal rivalry in hand. So this is the big brain right here. So we trigger my twice dead. I've got nine energy. And now I'm able to pop a second Doombringer as well as a stun. But that stun also triggers the damage, and I broke the survivor here. So now I've got two Doombringers going off, and I wiped out his entire board. And if he has an Eternal Rivalry, it's good game. But he didn't have an Eternal Rivalry. And you can't see it. We're on a frozen screen. That's because he resigned. So that was a surprising turnaround, but it actually worked out as good as it possibly could uh, I mean, in, in an overwhelming situation. So that's how Cash and Vaughn, at least with what I've been building and evolving him, is working. It's working a lot better than it started out. It was a, it was a rough, it was, like I said, it was like 50% maybe at best here and there. Um, and following the changes that I did, Following the inclusions of Doombringers instead of those Dreadnoughts, they just they just work better. Again, you could put in Border Carriers instead of the uh, Doombringers if you don't have those. Uh, you'll you'll see some good results. Um, and then Forge Complex instead of Mount Pharos has come in handy in those games, either from giving me uh, Pi Alphas, uh, just extra body troops, some uh, some frontline bodies, Skatari. It's a good card and I think that there's no answer to it from your opponent and in this deck that's really they can answer so much more of your stuff that you're putting on the board but they can't answer your forge complex and it makes a world of a difference and I've had a lot of fun with it and I think with 87 different warlords in the game now guys there's no reason why you can't try something new out and these guys like I said it's not it's not a fantastic change I really would have liked to see them give him the twice dead and then lower his ability to cost one or uh, even give him the same ability but allow him to act again so he could do anywhere between you know five damage to the board to you know just dealing three damage you know using his ability and attacking one time um, that could be very powerful but at the same time he's got low initiative and he doesn't have a whole lot else going for him. Poor Cash and Fawn. Poor Cash and Fawn. But I like it. I, I've been, I've been, uh, I, I talked about it when they did the patches. I was looking forward to working on it. It spent some time. It's not, maybe it's not 100% perfect. Maybe there's a card or two in here to change or tweak around. But uh, I think overall, I've been pleased with its results. And it can work as it's shown. You just have to play smart, you have to build and play accordingly. And I think you can do that with any warlord. I think sometimes people just don't don't feel comfortable enough, or they see it, they're like, "Eh, I can't." Well, he's just terrible. Well, he he's not as easy to play as others, but nobody's terrible. And just to prove the point, one day I will do a, a deck with Nimitor. But that day is not today. <laughs> so, uh, with that being said, guys. I am glad to have shared this with you. I hope you liked it. If you found it interesting or you want to look forward to more deck lists coming up, uh, other videos, contests, please like and subscribe. Spread the news of the channel. Share it with your friends, with your lodge mates if you haven't already. Um, you know, I just I'm trying to get trying to get more folks to to see that there's more beyond just top fifty. And there is. I mean, don't get me wrong. Top fifty is you know those are players playing all the time, every day, night and day. But we've got events, we've got 87, and we're going to be going on 88, 89 Warlords as we get the uh, the fourth White Scars and the fourth Runestorm Warlord. Um, it's a card game. It's just show up, play. It's like if playing casual card games at your, uh, at your tabletop. Are you having fun? If you're not having fun, then examine why you're playing the game. And if you uh, have to figure out what you have to do to have fun, try something new. Try something new. Next uh, next time, I think I'm going to do Corbax, which I know that's Ruin Storm. It's Icky Sticky Ruin Storm. But uh, I got a build for him as well. 
that and after his after the revision after his uh, adjustment where he's lost some power um, that's really when I started playing with him to see if I could get him to still work fairly well and he does um, but nobody I think everybody goes with Kabanda unless they don't have Kabanda then maybe they play Corvax or maybe they just play Rom that's more likely the case I think that's probably the case if you don't have yeah. I don't know. Uh, if this was good for you, you guys want to see war- other Warlords, other decks featured, please also hit that up in the comments. Um, why not? Why not? Uh, I, got, I, got, I got a week or two to do, uh, and I got some deck lists to put up. And also, just a quick plug, I'm going to do another video here for, for July community um, events. So that's going to come up. It's going to highlight the contest. It's going to highlight some tournament action and some other activities. Uh, but I'm going to bring back... I'm going to bring back for a week or two Bar Night Legions. It's coming back, baby. It was only here for a short time last 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 year. It's coming back and it's going to be fantastic. There'll be boozing and smoozing and cards games and casual play and fun that will be had and someone will walk away with the title of the Meodmeister. The Umjod. Umjod Meister. For those who have been around for for a while. Are you in need of some Yod or some Umjod? Perhaps you should join us on on Bar Night Legions. So uh and I am and to kind of go hand in hand with that, I'm also kind of looking to get myself upgraded here, patched up. I might actually be able to do some stream play. I don't know. That might be talking a little bit too much. I'm just I'm I just do things on my phone, but I'm I like to. I like to be able to do that and uh, have some more interaction with folks. So that being said, everybody, thanks for tuning in. I hope this was helpful for you. I hope uh, you you got some ideas. I hope it was just something to kind of shake up the monotony and show that Cash and Vaughn, he's not, uh, he didn't, it's not the buff that we wanted, but it's the buff that we deserved. That's, uh, yes, that's that's what I'm going to say it is. It's not what we wanted. It's the buff that we deserved. And it's not even the buff that we needed. It's just the buff that we deserved. We deserve something. All right, guys. That's it for me. Thanks again. And uh, until then, until next time, keep playing Legions. We'll talk to you later. Bye.